marriage, awareness, the epitome of life. Awareness, as the word is used in Buddhist terminology and invoking of the heart center or kalp zakir hona is the term used in Sufi terminology, is the epitome of life. And all that is concerned with various aspects of life and living. Just as when a child is born, it undergoes many changes in the process of its growth, so too is each system. Sufism, Nakshbandi Tarikat, when it evolved from through Hadrat Abu Bakr Siddiq Raziyallah Ta'ala it continued to be known as Siddiqiyya. Then it came to be known as Tefurian, Khwazaganya, and then Nakshbandiya was added. It became Nakshbandiya and it still continues to be known as Nakshbandiya with a few suffixes added to it. For instance, Nakshbandiya Mujaddadiya. It is because of the significance of a particular shape and is his contribution along the path of Nakshbandi Tarikat or its growth. Nakshbandi Hakimi, Nakshbandi Mujaddadi Majhariya. When Hazrat Khwaza Amkan Ki Raziyallah Ta'ala Unu sent his Khalifa, Hazrat Baki Willa Raziyallah Ta'ala Unu, he instructed that I am sending you to a distant land. A land which is fertile, fertile for the inward journey. It is the land of ancient wisdom, the land of Buddhas, the land of Vedas. It was an indication for something to be overlooked. But in fact, the advent of Hadrat Baki Villa was for the beginning of a new millennium and for the growth, for the birth of Hazrat Mujaddadi Alif Sani Raziyallah Ta'ala But at that time and until Hazrat Noor Muhammad Badayuni Raziyallah Ta'ala it continued to remain influenced by Islamic traditions. Other groups were not allowed to enter into the inner realm of Sufism, of Nakshbandi Tariqat. It was Hadrat Mazhar Mir Jane Jana Raziyallah Ta'ala Unu who studied the other systems because a new trend was knocking at the door of Nakshbandi Tariqat. He studied the ancient Hindu and the Vedic systems and it brought out many similarities between the terminologies used by ancient sages and the Sufi masters. It was a period of liberal but there was a lot of resistance from the existing system. It is something like this when we are studying the anatomy. Anatomy is the study of the bone system and the inner system of the human body. Different people are studying, different languages are being used, Spanish, French, Russian, English. Will there be any difference in the process of the study of the anatomy or physiology of the human body. But the expression may be different, words may be different. I remembered an incident some time ago, daughter of a friend of ours, when they were living in Trinidad, called one day, I was alone at home, she asked, I want to speak to auntie. 
I told her she is not home. Is there anything that I can help you? She said, no, I need to talk to auntie and I'll call back. She called back after some time. She looked a little worried. I said, tell me what is the matter? She said, I have organized a party for my friends and husband's friends. We need to make some Indian dishes, so I need to call auntie to find out how to make this. I said, do you want me to assist you? Tell me what assistance or what thing that you want to make and you are finding difficulty. So no, that's all right, I'll call auntie. This is ignorance. Such is the situation of each one of us that this is my master, I cannot learn from this one or that one. That means one has not really understood what is meant by being a master. Master is not a person. Although he exists as a person, but he is the bridge between the form and formless. There is a formless in him which is light, which is awareness. And then this light, formless, manifests through the form. Electrical current is at play at each one of the electrical equipments. It is the electric current which we, none of us can see it, but we can see its usage and experience its versatility. When it manifests through different equipments, I call these as body, mind and intellect equipment, just as AC, fridge, stove, each manifests a certain quality of the electric current. The manifestation is different. In the same when this light begins to manifest through the form of a mass, it is the formless or the nur or awareness is manifesting. This kalb is zaku. There is light in it. And when this light falls or any circumstance or situation of any person who is in despair, it is like an X-ray light. It begins to show. When this light is lit within you, of which you had been unaware, it does not matter what are you doing, making love, eating, sleeping, cooking, walking, talking, writing, painting, doing a sculpture, music or anything else. What is then essential is your awareness and light that you are. With that light, life will move in a different direction and that is why awareness is the epitome of life and living. Buddha says, be a light unto yourself. Just before he entered into Mahasamadhi, someone asked, what is your message? Buddha said, my message has been my life. Still you are asking what it is. He said, be a light unto yourself. In Buddhist terminology he said, Apodipu Bhava, be a light unto yourself. That is his greatest message or insight. Nobody else in the entire history of human consciousness has been as respectful towards others as Gautam, the Buddha. He has been respected towards each one of us. Before that, God was the center of the existence. We have to seek God. We are looking for something which is unknown and unknowable. With Buddha the journey began with you. I am interested in you alone because you can be transformed. When the light is thrown into you, everything begins to come in the right perspective. Life begins to move in a totally different direction. What am I to do with 
those who are drunk and gone. Umar Khayyam's one of the verse which is translated into a simple Urdu language Kya ho haasil unke zikr se jo pee kar mast huye hai What shall you gain O fool by talking about those who are drunk and gone? You have to find your own way. Sometimes talking is good enough but unless and until it helps in your own process of growth it is of no use. You are going for your honeymoon but you are reading the books and talking to those people who have finished their honeymoon. The word Buddha will be repeated again and again and it is being used again and again by Bodhidharma. You have to understand what it means. It is not a personal name for anybody. In Sikh religion, all the masters use the word Nanak. It is, whether it is the first guru or the second or third, all messages, songs are recorded as Nanak. It is not a personal name of anybody. Buddha simply means one who is awakened, a totally awakened, one who is an embodiment of light, awareness, shining like a thousand suns. Gautam Buddha is the most famous awakened one, but that does not mean that he is the only awakened one. There have been many Buddhas before him and there will be many after him as long as every human being does not become a Buddha. A new Buddha will go on springing up in the future. He was the first cultured and most educated, most sophisticated person ever to become a mystic. There is no comparison between the two awakened persons in the whole history. Everyone comes to add a new page to the existing scripture. When a house is built, it undergoes through various stages. Various persons come to add, to lay their helping hand in the process, the architect the builder, the one who works as an ordinary mason, electrician, plumber, interior decorator, all these add a new dimension according to their own capacity, according to their own expertise and finally the structure is ready. So too is the process of spiritual growth. Buddha saw where the innocent mystics had unknowingly given chances for cunning minds to take advantage. He decided not to use any positive term for the ultimate goal to destroy your ego and any possibility of your ego taking any advantage. He called the ultimate nothingness because as long as you have your room which is filled with many things, you can see that. You can see the furniture, you can see the paintings, you can see this and that. When you remove everything from there, in a sense the room is empty. Yet still the room is not empty because there is room in it. Something which you cannot see. This is Buddha's way of and he called it Shunya or Zero. Now how can ego make zero the goal? God can be made the goal but zero or nothingness cannot be made a goal. Whenever new disciples used to come to him he would ask them to just sit by his side silently for two years, then something will be possible. Then I can say something to you and you will be able to understand. 
because master connects between form and formless he is sharing his presence the formlessness that he has to use the words to share with you he has to use the language that you can understand but the message that he wants to give cannot be condensed into the words you ask me what is green and i write on a piece of paper green the paper is white i may use any ink that is available and write in that color green what will that be green green can be written in a red color yellow color blue color but will that be a representation of green it is simply an indication buddha says even if you meet me on the way kill me immediately by saying this he is asking the disciples not to follow him instead this is what sufis call three things are important tark ke tark first to abandon the logic along the path tark ke upad the desire for the other worldliness and tark ke maula if a master does not free his disciple of himself he is not a master when i was teaching in the university the first thing i used to do when i entered into the new session to look at how many students has come from the previous class one or two is accepted if majority of the students come from the previous class that means they have not graduated they have not learned and i have not been able to transmit all that they have come to this class for i have to free them of my myself so that they can be promoted to a next standard where they will be in touch with another teacher and the process continues what is important is to understand the master and just take the hints try to understand imbibe the presence the spirit that he is feel his presence and then go on your own way live according to your own light however small it is does not matter however if the light is yours and you live according to it you will go on through gautam buddha had to deny that god existed not that he was against god a man like gautam cannot be against god and if gautam buddha is against god then it is of no use for anybody else to be in favor of god this decision is decisive for the entire humanity he represents our very soul he is the epitome of consciousness but he was not against god he was against your ego and that was his way to sublimate your ego and he was constantly careful not to give your ego any support or demand if god can become a support then there is no need mahavir and buddha both insisted on non violence the basic reason for not fighting is that once you stop fighting the ego cannot exist ego exists only in conflict the ego exists in fight it is a consequence of fight the more you fight the more ego exists and gets strengthened if you alone remain on the earth nobody to fight with would you have an ego you would not have buddha emphasized meditation the sufi word is used for it maraqaba it comes from the root rukba means waiting in one sense and it has many other connotations 
Meditation is a totally different technique. There is no need to believe, no need to move to the other. You are alone there and you have to meet yourself. Gautam Buddha was born on a full moon night. He became enlightened on the full moon night. And finally he entered Mahaparinirvana on full moon night as well. This cannot be just coincidence. His type has something to do with a synchronicity of full moon night. The next time you enter the temple of Gautam Buddha or happen to be in the presence of a Buddha, just sit silently, watch the statue. The statue has been made in such a way in such proportions that if you watch it, you will fall silent. This is a statue of meditation. All the sculptures, the idols that has been made and with the purpose have not been understood, was that these are the symbols of meditation. It is not concerned with Gautam Buddha, we do not know what he looked like, simply an, a symbol of meditation. The story of Gautam Buddha is that when he reached the gates of Nirvana, he stood there. His back was towards the gate. The gates were opened and the guards wanted him to enter. They were ready to welcome him because centuries passed. And then once a while, those gates opened. They were immensely happy that someone has again become a Buddha, the awakened one. But Buddha refused. The story is symbolic. He says, unless every living being passes by me, by me into Nirvana, I am going to stay here. I will be the last one to enter. I cannot go alone. I have to take everybody with me. They are struggling in pain and misery. And do you think I should enjoy Nirvana and its tremendous blissfulness? Master suffers. Master feels your pain. Yet still he is unaware. When you go and mention your problems to him, he is deeply concerned about it. Buddha said, it is not possible, I will wait. You can wait, but waiting here I will have, I will try to help those struggling souls, stumbling and groping in darkness. Unless I am satisfied that everybody has passed him, I will not come in and you can close the doors. Buddha is certainly one of the most insightful men. He does not stop at himself. Anybody would have stopped there. It is a natural tendency to put oneself at the highest point and then stop. I have visited a few places. The places where Gautam Buddha became enlightened with known as Bodh Gaya, a small temple is there. Some followers made the temple as a memo memorial by the side of the tree under which Gautam became enlightened. That tree still remembers something. And I came to know later on that Bodhi tree has a certain substance which no other tree has. And that is the substance which makes a man a genius. Only geniuses have that substance in their mind. And in the world of trees, only the Bodhi tree has that substance. Perhaps it is more perceptive, perceptive and receptive. It has a certain genius. A Buddha asleep is such a beautiful phenomenon. He looks like a small child. 
innocent, with no burden of the day. To look at a Buddha while he is asleep is very beautiful and by Buddha I had mentioned in the very beginning all those who are awake in the world, irrespective of their outer appearances, each one of the sheikh, each one of the sages, each one of the masters in whom that light, that means is incandescent with the Buddha, is the term with the Christ. Anand used to watch Buddha go to sleep and Anand would sit and look at him. He was such a silent pool of being. Nothing was incomplete. Everything, every moment was complete and perfect. This comes only when the lamp is lit in you and each one of your actions, thought, is guided by that light, is incandescent with that light. It does not matter what you, what are you doing. There is no, there was no dream or traces left in him. His mind was crystal clear, never. The stream of consciousness was never muddy. It was crystal clear. He is the greatest breakthrough that humanity has known up to now. Hazrat Mujadid Alif Sani Razila Talaun was a breakthrough. Hazrat Baki Villa Razila Talaun was a breakthrough. Hazrat Mazar Mirja Nejana Razila Talaun is a breakthrough. It is better to say, use the word is for all these masters. Time should not be divided by the name of Jesus Christ. It should be divided by the name of the awakened ones. We should divide history before awakening and after awakening. Buddha is a continuity, a breakthrough. Jesus represents the past in its tremendous beauty and grandeur. He is the very essence of the whole search of man before him. He is the fragrance of all the past endeavors of man to know God, but he is not breakthrough. In the real sense of the word, he was not a rebel. Buddha is, but Jesus looks more rebellious than Buddha for the simple reason that Jesus' rebellion is visible and Buddha's rebellion is invisible. He does not see anything. But in his presence, things happen. Just remain silent. Allow the light to manifest. Whatever comes in front of it gets incandescent. And when the light is there, all the darkness from within, all the problems begin to disappear. You will need great insight to understand what Buddha has contributed to human consciousness, its evolution and human growth. It is in the same way, it is not possible to understand the contribution of the great masters of the world, whether it belongs to Sufi tradition, the Nakshbandi aspect, Branch, Hazrat Mujadid Ali Sani Razila Talauno, Hazrat Faza Muhammad Masum Razila Talauno, Hazrat Nur Muhammad Badayuni Razila Talauno, or for that matter any other person. It is all necessary in the, for human consciousness, its evolution and human growth. The contribution of Lalaji to bring the Hindu element into it. He had the full authority on many Izazat, Khilafat and many other paths, Nanak and Kabir, that he gained through Swami Brahmanand who lived on the banks of the river Ganges that flowed in the city where he lived. 
and there used to be secret meetings between Hazrat Maulana Fazl Ahmad Khan Razillah Taala Unu and Swami Brahmanand. That was the available path then. I have encompassed many other dimensions to this body of the spiritual, included the Zen, the Buddhism, and all the other known paths that can help a seeker to overcome. to evolve and become multidimensional like an ocean ocean carries the water of all the devils that are available in the world and yet still it has its own presence man would have been the same if there had been no christ no krishna there would have not been much difference we know buddha and something of tremendous importance is lost but his value in its very subtle when we look at the growth of the hindu incarnations ram was a symbol of austerity a symbol of straight forwardness a discipline with krishna love evolved love become became more important aspect of human growth but buddha he has the austerity of ram that is one aspect seriousness and love and that is why in buddha love does not remain as love it does not become devotion instead it becomes compassion compassion is the highest form of love and out of this comes into existence forgiveness if you do not have compassion you cannot have forgiveness and forgiveness and compassion are the two most vital tools for the growth of human consciousness for the journey together when two people come together through a marriage or a male female that law if you have not learned if your meditation if your awareness has not transformed into compassion forgiveness will not come and unless you have these two wings forgiveness and compassion you cannot continue in life in because life means you have to relate to someone on a day to day basis at home you have to relate to your children to your spouse and if forgiveness and compassion is not there you cannot continue in life evolution is not possible these are two vital tools with these using it correctly you evolve and when you are not able to use these tools and understand their nature you will not be able to progress before buddha the religious search was fundamentally a concern with god a god who is outside a god who is somewhere ever in the heavens as is conceived the moment we talk about god our eyes always look upwards a god who is somewhere high in the heavens the religious search was also concerned with an object of desire as much as worldly search was what are you doing i am seeking is spirituality of god the worldly man sought money power prestige and the other worldly man was seeking god heaven eternity and truth but one thing was common both were looking outside themselves both were extroverts remember this word because this is going to help you to understand buddha 
with Buddha, the search became inward, introvert. The religious search was not concerned with the within, instead it was concerned with without. What is within, that is what is important for growth, that which is within, because growth is an inward phenomenon. Otherwise, people grow outwardly, but inwardly they do not grow. They remain childish. And Jesus very clearly says, one who is childlike, that means Psychologically you are growing and physically as well. Inward means psychologically you are growing. All searches were extrovert before Buddha. And when the religious search is extrovert, it is not really religious. Religion begins only with introversion. Unless you move within, Raman Maharishi used to say, nothing else is important, go within. And when you go within, then you will be able to discover all that is there. Nanak says, the outside pilgrimage is merely a reflection of inner, where the meridians, the energy channels intersect with one another. That is a pilgrimage. That is the holy place. Chinese use the art of meridians and where the meridians intersect one another. According to Chinese system of medicine, it is called a block, a block of energy. When someone gets into a problem, it is a blockage in the energy and the master through his awareness, through his tawajju, through his energy field, clears up those blocks and the path becomes easy. The journey of religiousness begins only with introversion, when you start diving deeply within yourself. Only there you can find the gems the precious gems. Thus remember that awareness is the light that you have been given as a formless and you have become oblivious of it in the company of the Sheikh, in the company of Master. You become once again aware of this, it begins to shine and your path becomes incandescent. Then it does not matter where you are applying this light. You have that source of light in you. You have that body, mind and intellect equipment. You have the electric stove. It does not matter what you cook on this. It does not matter what you use that energy for. You can use for anything, any aspect of life and living, including the male-female relation, marriage, sex, intelligence, it is that principle, that light is that guiding force. Wherever it is applied, it brings a new perspective in you, a new vision, a new understanding. Live with this light. Be a light unto yourself.